Okay, let's get to the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. I'll begin reading in verse 4. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. In verse 10, and God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. In verse 12, the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after its kind, and a tree yielding fruits whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. In verse 18, and a rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. See the little trend we got going here now? All right, verse 25, And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for building relationships and friendships. And thank you for the people that this time I've got to be a little closer to. I've got to know a little better. And Lord, I appreciate that very much, especially in this days and time that we live in and the people that you don't know that you can trust or you can trust. God, I feel like I can trust these folks here. My heart's needed with this pastor and his burden. God, I appreciate that. Lord, I thank you so much for letting me be here, but I want to ask you to touch me right now. Lord, let old Rob Hicks just move out of the way. And Lord, I pray that... Uh, People would just key in on the Spirit of Almighty God, the Bible, the Word of God. Lord, let me just be an instrument, a tool, or something, Lord, that you can use, a vessel, Lord, a messenger, that you just open up the Word of God and just speak to them about what it says. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. As we read these verses, read these verses, we see that everything that God does is good. Amen. We have to ask ourselves this question, why are we here? Who's responsible for us to be in here? We're here simply because of Satan, simply because of people going to hell every single day. That's why we're here. That's why we come together. God organized this church. He organized this church for a reason, uh, and that's to feed us and feed us from the Word of God, from the old shepherd here and that is leading us through the Word of God and encouraging us to do the will of God. Now, who don't like that? We know who don't like that. Satan doesn't like it. I'm not fixing to preach you anything that you hadn't heard. Not one thing. I doubt very seriously. All I want to do is before I leave and go out of here is just push a little refresh button. Just a little refresh button. Sometimes we need to be refreshed about the wonderful truths that's in the Word of God. That's what we need. You know, years ago, the old computers that come out and then things would get all cluttered up and they had a button on there and that button said refresh. And you hit that thing and it refreshed that whole system. Now, everything that God created was good until somebody showed up. Turn up with me to Genesis chapter 3 and we'll see when he showed up. I want to preach this thought. What do you get when Satan comes out of the shadows? What do you get when Satan comes out of the shadows? Genesis 3, 1, the Bible said, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat. Of every tree of the garden. Son, I'm going to tell you something. He showed up lying right there. He's been a liar ever since. Amen. He simply said to Eve, Hath God said. He just simply wanted Eve to question God. He didn't walk in. He didn't crawl up and throw God under the bus. He didn't walk in and cut him down. No, no, no. He just said, really, you know, hath God said. And if he said it, did he really mean it? I mean, right. come on. Let me say this right here. I say this. I try to say this at every meeting. If I go to a church or go to a camp, I try to say it at least one night. It's my favorite statement that I've ever made. And that statement is, please don't sacrifice what you want most for what you want at the moment. I can't say that enough. Don't sacrifice what you want most for what you want at the moment. I don't care how spiritual you are this morning. I don't care how much you read your Bible. I don't care how close you walk with God. I don't care how much you pray. You will be tempted. I don't care. Why? Well, because we're in this flesh. This flesh is the one part of us that is not, wasn't saved, didn't get saved, and never shall be saved. Right. It's wicked, it's vile, it's always going to do wrong, want to do wrong. We have to buffet it and beat it down. So you're going to be tempted. What are you saying? I'm saying don't sacrifice what you want most for what you want at the moment. Because that moment when temptation comes across you, and I could show you tens of thousands of people that would stand behind this pulpit and say, I wish I wouldn't have done it. I wish I wouldn't have made that decision. I wish I wouldn't have did it, but I was tempted. I was tempted and I did it. Don't 
Do it. If you want a godly marriage, then don't sacrifice what you want most for what you want in the moment. If you want godly finances, don't sacrifice what you want most for what you want in the moment. If you want godly children, then don't sacrifice what you want most for what you want at the moment, okay? What you want most is a godly home. So don't sacrifice it. Amen. I did a study on that word subtle there. The Bible said the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. It's cunning, crafty, deceitful, sly, wily, refined, keen, overnice, clever, smooth, skillfully executed, and mischievously artful. All a synonymous wording with the word subtle, and that's who Satan was and is. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What do you get when Satan comes out of the shadows? Number one, you get destruction. You get destruction. You get destruction in homes and marriages and ministries and churches and relationships. And I could go on and on and on. How does he bring destruction? Questioning God. He did it to Eve. And she questioned God's authority. And then it was passed on to Adam. And then it was passed on down, 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 down to it's all way right here. What happens? The same thing happened to my daddy. I told you a little bit this morning, okay? Daddy was in our serving God. Mama got saved. My brother, which is uh, 65 years old today, he got saved. My sister, and they're in their uh, 60s and upper 50s, and they got saved. And I was born that year. I'm the youngest. The closest one to me is eight years away, okay? They were all saved in that church serving God for five years, okay? But when that church split, you heard me say it, daddy was grounded on personal relationships rather than being grounded on the word of God. And he fell out of church. Why? Because he questioned God. You sir sit here and say that you won't do that. Do you really mean it? Do you really mean it? Or somebody cuts your throat out here or runs you down or talks bad about your wife or throws you under the bus. What are you going to do? Oh, I don't want nothing to do with those people. They'll hurt you. Oh, the word of God hadn't hurt you. God hadn't hurt you. You're going to walk away because of that. The only way you'll walk away is if you do what Eve did. Question God. Amen. Because God has nothing to do with any of that foolishness. Amen. Questioning God. My life was wasted as a young teenager. Liquor, drugs, drive-by shooting, trouble with the law, almost suicide. And I can go on and on and on, but it was passed down to me. Because the generation before me, my father. I didn't know anything about God. Huh? I wonder today, who in here is going to let Satan destroy him? I hope nobody. I hope you make vital decisions based on preaching and pray, based on the word of God, that you're not. You're not going to sacrifice what you want most for what you want at the moment. Huh? Number two, what do you get when Satan comes out of the shadow? You get salvation. Thank God. Amen. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. Son, it's going to get good. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 19, and a great dragon was uh, cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which was deceived the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels was cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accuses them before God. God day and night. Listen here. Listen verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto death. And therefore rejoice ye in heaven and ye that dwell among it. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea and the devil is cast down uh, unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. His time is getting shorter every single day my friend. He knows he's got a short time and he's working double time trying to destroy our teenagers, trying to destroy our marriages, try to destroy our homes, but he's lost the war, friend. It's by the blood of the Lamb. If you're under the blood of the Lamb today, you are saved by the grace of God. Yeah. Salvation is the greatest thing on the face of this earth, friend. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Perry hit it on the head a while ago. If you would have told me those years back that I'd be standing up here with a Bible, I'd say, you lost your cotton-picking mind. You can't get, you got to go to school to get educated to be that stupid, amen. <laughs> Well, Jesus Christ is everything. Amen. Everything. Now you think about salvation just a minute. Let's push a refresh button just a minute. How long have you just, how long has it been since you just stopped and walked through the streets of Jerusalem? If I start getting where I feel a little tainted, a little dirty, been going way too long, been working way too hard, 
Huh? If I start feeling that way, I take me a trip to Jerusalem. Yeah. I, I, I kick back and get on the history channel of my mind is what I do. Why? Because I see a man walking out there in Jerusalem. And I hear an angry crowd yelling and screaming, guilty, 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 crucify him, crucify him, guilty. Guilty of what? He wasn't guilty of anything. He was perfect. He was sinless. He never even gave a thought to a sin. Can let the inner, inner our mind. He was absolutely spiritual. Spotless, without blemish, but they called him guilty. Oh, and they got him and arrested him. Oh, they took him in. The Bible said they buffeted him, friend. What's that? That's brood force from a man with his fist beating somebody as hard as they can possibly beat. Oh, you have a lot of you men and like myself, I don't know how many fights I've been in. I've been in multiple fights. And it's something about seeing a fist coming where you fight that you got something in your system that you can do something. I can't explain it, but you absorb it. You're ready for it and you keep back fighting and you give all you got. You're absorbing it. What if somebody put a big old a bag over your head, a big old a sack over your head? You can't prepare for anything. That's the way our Savior was. He was totally blind. He couldn't see it coming and brewed force from a Roman soldier beating him in the face. I'm not talking about the cotton picking world's version of it. I'm not talking about the pictures of Walmart they have in there of our Savior. Don't even let any of that enter your mind. That's not in the Bible. I'm talking about the Bible account. I'm talking about the man Christ Jesus. I'm talking about the Son of God. I'm talking about God Himself in the flesh and what He dealt with for you and I because He loved me. I'm going to tell you the Bible said He'll be a beyond recognition. I believe His face looked like hamburger meat. I believe His eyes eyes were turned inside out. The Bible said he's beyond recognition. That means even his own family wouldn't have known who he was if they didn't see or witness what would have happened. I'm going to tell you something. Why did he do that? He did that because of a sorry low down drunkard in East Central Alabama that needed to die and go to hell. But he had me on his mind. A drunkard over in North Carolina walking around involved in everything he could be involved with. But Jesus Christ had him on his mind when he was at the cross. So that wasn't it. They plucked his beard out. They stripped him of his garments. Man, can you imagine how embarrassing that must have been? But he, a sin couldn't stop him. Oh, no. The, oh, they spat upon him. Now, buddy, I'm going to tell you something, boy. You've got to love people to be able to deal with something like that. Them old people lined up out there and spit on nasty words of corruption. That's another fault I got right there, brother. I'm here to tell you, say I'm spiritual if you want to. But if you spit on me before I get to that door, it's fifth city right there. Somebody pray for me. Amen. Yes, nasty and filthy and vile. But our shame. Look way beyond that. The immunity of his love. The realness of his desire. The truth of being the son of God. Amen. They took the cat of nine tails. An instrument with a wooden handle about yay long. Nine leather thongs on it with bone and metal and glass. And they whipped his back and they whipped him in deep lacerations coming to his body. You can study the history books if you want to. Many people that were going to be crucified never made it to the cross. They died of the scourge. They died of the scourge. But not our Savior. He went on. He went on to the cross. The Bible said they put him on that cross of Calvary. Oh, his joints come apart. And you imagine the pain and the agony. Oh, I'm going to tell you how he died. He died of suffocation. It was just like drowning in a body of water because his body couldn't pick him up and his lungs collapsed. Let me tell you something folks if that don't grip you I don't know what will grip you as a Christian. Amen. And if you're sitting under the sound of my voice lost today oh God center yourself to somebody that loves you and still loves you unconditionally. We'll save you on the spot right now. I told you I'd change my verse. Galatians 2.20, I've crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I yet live, but yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life of I which live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's just hit a refresh button this morning. Let's just let it all soak in what this thing is about in Christianity. What this thing is about church. What this thing is about soul winning. What this thing is about testimony. What this thing is about the Bible. What do you get when Satan comes out of the shadows? Destruction, salvation, and praise 
God, you get proclamation. Proclamation changed my life, friend. I didn't know anything about it. What is it? It's preaching. Hey, its definition is publication by authority, official notice given to the public. Talking about preaching, you can't have a devil without destruction, can't have a savior without salvation, and you can't have a preacher without proclamation. Amen. I want to understand sound of my voice. Any of you men called to preach, huh? You just like I was? You running from it? Nine months, I like to went slap crazy. My wife thought I lost my cotton picking mind. You say you didn't want to preach. I wanted to preach. A bunch of preachers that confused my mind told me that if there's anything else you can do in life, then you're not called to preach. That's a lie out of hell. I said that's a lie out of hell. I finally got so tore up, I just walked the aisle and fell on my face and I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to preach to you. Shut me down. Hey, 25 years he ain't even slowed me down, amen. Still preaching from the time I got up. I wonder, I wonder if he stirred your heart, sir. I wonder if you've been hidden in the crowd. You know God called you to preach. The greatest thing you'll ever do after salvation is surrender to the will of Almighty God. Amen. Amen. Hey, Isaiah 6, 8 said, Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then he said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah 61, 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good times unto the meek. He have sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open up the prison of them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all them that mourn. Praise God for preachers. Amen. I'm going to tell you, we need more preachers. Uh, son, I'm talking about no cotton-picking women either. Amen. You know why the women's gumping up in the pulpit? It's because the men won't surrender anymore. Amen. Let me give you some news. It was a rooster that crowed and woke Peter up, and not a hen, amen. Amen. <laughs> You say, what kind of message is this? I just call it an Alabama wildcat message. It just scratches everything it gets around. <laughs> I said this, and it's got me in trouble before. I think that if I was going to work in the Bible college, I'd probably need to work in the dining hall, amen. That's where I'd probably need to work. You say, why, Brother Rob? You say, because when we was kids, now listen, don't you, now all you kids put your fingers in your ears right now and forget about all this stuff and don't listen to me. I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying it's true. But when I was young, you could actually take some old shotgun shells and get some gunpowder out and you could mix it up with some dog food and you could give that to an old dog. He could be the skinniest, scroungiest, little old stupidest looking thing you ever seen in your life. And son, he would turn out to be super dog. He would go absolutely slap crazy. Son, I'm talking about meaner than a junkyard bull. Dog. The only way you can stop him is beat his brains out with an aluminum baseball bat. Son, it does something with the brain waves. You say, oh, I see now. Yeah, put me in a dining hall with all these Bible colleges around here and I would be buying more shotgun shells than they could ship to America. Grinding it up and putting in their food. Amen. Because we need some preachers that's not for sale. Amen. 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 I mean not for sale. I mean, in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible said, And they, the days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He didn't come picking no cotton picking guitar, amen. Yeah, you're going to get beat down. Yeah, you're going to get uh, I've been so low, son, I feel like I could crawl under a snake's belly. And I'm, he said, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And I know you probably have too. I don't know if I can take it anymore. I don't know if I can deal with it anymore. Oh, Jeremiah was there in Jeremiah 20 and verse 9. He said, Then I said I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name but his word was shut up in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay bless God if it's in the heart it's got to come out somewhere you may snub us down you may beat us around you may kick us down somewhere but we're coming back up amen, amen. amen. we need preachers who is it who is it on the sound of my voice I'm not coming to you I don't want you coming to me I want you coming to Christ if he's called you, that's the only one you worry about coming to. You come to him and announce to him, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm a vessel that's willing to surrender the rest of my life to preach the gospel. Preaching. Amen. Preaching. I was so scared when I surrendered to preach. It took me back to a story. When I was a little kid, my daddy said, it's time for you to learn how to plow, boy. And I went out there and grabbed that old Single tree plow stock behind that 1953 Jubilee. If you don't know what that is, that's a little Ford tractor. We had a mule and that mule died. And I said, Daddy, what you gonna do? He said, I'll tell you what we're not gonna do. We're not gonna buy another mule, boy. He said, you see that 
53 Jubilee forward tractor out there, that's going to be the mule from now on. Put that plow stock in my hand. I said, man, this is exciting. This is good stuff. I'm fixing to break up some fallow ground, man. I'm going to learn how to plow, 14 years old. My daddy took off and that plow went in the ground, wham, like this right here, and it caught a root or something. It jumped up like this. Well, when it jumped up, I turned around and looked behind me. And when I did, I spun back around and it jumped over here and over here. And it messed up the whole road, man. And my daddy, he just looked back at me like that right there. And I saw what, daddy's got three things that he'd done before he took action to it. That was the first one. That scared me to death. I knew it didn't have but two more. He turned around. He said, all right, try it again. He dropped that thing back, dropped my plow down, took off again. I didn't get 15 feet, hung a rock. That thing jumped over. Well, man, when it jumped over, I was like, I got to look back and see where I messed up. When I looked back, that thing jumped back over again. It done it again. Oh, my soul. Next time, daddy's next signal is wipes the sweat off his forehead. I said, oh, that's number two, man. <laughs> Came but three. That's three. He started back over. Pay attention, boy. And I dropped that plow. Went down through there. Again, I ain't 15 or 20 foot. I hit something else. Same exact thing. Bam, bam. He throws that thing up in neutral. Snatches that hat off. And that was it when the hat comes off. And he jumps up. He gets right in my face. And when he got in my face, he pointed right into my face, touched my nose. And I could still see today that sweat just dropping off his nose and stuff. And he's yelling at me. He said, boy, you're going to make plenty of mistakes. You look at your face. Father, and you'll make a lot less mistakes. And I said, my soul. I, I, wait a minute. Where did that come from? When I surrendered to preach, I never thought of that story until I surrendered to preach. Because I kept telling my God, I can't do this. I can't speak to people. I'm going to make so many mistakes. I don't know English. I don't know grammar. I don't know how to pronounce half the things in the Bible. I can't do this. You look at me. Yeah. You look at the Father. The last thing you worry about is messing up. I prepare with all my heart when I preparation for preaching to God's people. And I toil in my heart for messages, but when it comes to it, when I step behind here, you can forget it. If I, if I blow it and uh, mispronounce something, if I tire the English language all to pieces, it's not because I hadn't tried. It's because that I'm looking at the Father. It's because I'm following Christ. People can say whatever they want to say. I lose myself in a message because I want to be captivated by the Spirit of Almighty God. Hey, if God's called you to preach, don't you worry about it. You just look at the Father and continue through life. If I looked at anything else, I guarantee you I wouldn't be preaching 25 years down the road. It wouldn't have happened. I'd be out and it'd be over with. Amen. What do you get? What do you get when Satan comes out of the shadows? You get destruction. You get salvation. You get proclamation. And now you're going to get transportation. Praise God. We all going to check out of here, man. All this stuff is going to be behind us. But of the time, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. For they shall say peace and safety and destruction cometh upon them as a veil, as a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in the darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of the light. And the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep or do others, but let us watch and be sober. Son, we are checking out of here. Amen. We're going up. And if you don't go up, you may go up first because you're going to go to the grave. Praise God the dead in Christ is going to rise first and then all the others are going to be caught up. It's going to happen. Amen. But have you given any thought? Man, when I was putting this message down, I gave it a lot of thought. I was thinking about what if it happened right now. And I, I mean, man, I've, I have flown tens of thousands of miles. And I got to thinking about, hey, I, what, if him, what, what, what if old pilots are saved? You think about soul winners all over the world reaching those pilots for the cause of Christ. Well, all of a sudden, if they're saved and the rapture happens, they're gone, man. They're checking out of here. You got an airplane doing six and seven hundred miles an hour straight down to the earth, okay? And that's not in one place. That is all over the entire global world, friend. Right. Son, I'm talking about destruction. I'm talking about momentarily destruction after the rapture. You think about all the truck driving the preachers out there and the people that are leading truck drivers to Christ at, uh, at truck stops. I used to go every single weekend and walk those truck stops and preach the gospel and see men saved 
every single weekend up in Chicago land. Let me tell you something, 80,000 pounds coming down the interstate at 70 and 80 miles an hour. They're gone. I mean, they're checking out of here. They're out of here. You got trucks everywhere. You got buildings mangled, cars mangled, and people's mangled. I'm trying to draw you a picture this morning of the Bible account of what's going to take place. Destruction everywhere that you can imagine. The Moors can't handle them. The hospitals can't handle them. But you and I are going to be gone if you're saved. If you're born again. If you're not, you're actually going to be left behind. I don't know who's saved in my presence or not. All I can do is just give the gospel. That should make us a little more attentive about people that can be left behind. Family yeah. members, yeah. friends, neighbors. I'm getting convicted myself. That's a very good thing. When I'm preaching and the Holy Ghost turns his finger right around in me and says, hey, you need to check up on some things too. You can be a more aggressive soul winner yourself, sir. You're up there preaching, so I'm going to tell you when the Spirit speaks to me, I'll tell you the Spirit speaking to me. I don't believe nobody can preach what I preach without the Spirit turning right back around and say we all can be more aggressive about our testimony, about Amen. giving the yeah. gospel out to a dying nation. Amen. I said, what happens when Satan shows up? You get destruction Salvation, proclamation, transportation, and then you get hesitation. You see, I know this church, and enough about it. I have not preached anything at all that you would disagree with, I imagine, would have. You'd agree with everything that I've preached. Amen. But we all have that little sin in us, procrastination. And a lot of times you have somebody that come in in your life that compliments you, helps you. Like me and my wife, it's amazing how that opposite attracts. I mean, she's the prettiest thing I ever saw in my life. That's why I stole that car, man. I mean, good night. I mean, I, I, son, I, I mean, I stepped up in life when I come across her, boy. But to compliment, she compliments because she's never been a procrastinator. I have been a procrastinator. And am still a procrastinator in certain things. Now, I'm a man of character. I get things done. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I do it. I kill myself to do it. But I still have the choice of all these responsibilities, the worst ones, I still tend to put them on the tail end of the list. Now, she's right the opposite. She puts them on the first end of the list. She knocks all of the rough ones out first, and then she coasts. Well, I don't do that kind of stuff. I'm a procrastinator. I put all the stuff I don't want to do on the end, then I just knuckle down, buckle down, and make it happen. But let me tell you something. That's the way we do in our Christianity, friend. That's the way we characterize it, and we procrastinate. You think about Jonah. Go to Nineveh. I already have their hearts prepared for the message. All you got to do is open up your mouth. I don't want to. Go to Tarsus. Leaves the will of God. Gets on the boat. By the way, you think, you think that you can cover up when you're not doing right? You're wrong. Your pastor won't throw you under the bus. He won't call you out. But your countenance completely tells on you every single time. The Lord said, go to Nineveh. No, but you're going to Tarsus. And some of you know you got a little of that in you. And your pastor's talking to you. And he's got all that love and grace. And he knows that he can see right straight through it. But he loves you so much he won't call you out. Because God has to call you out for it to do anything in your life. Don't think that you can cover that up. You can't. Your countenance always tells on you every single time. I can look at any of my kids and ask the question, countenance automatically, red light. Boy, you got one more cotton picking time, and then it's on in. Eh? Huh? The countenance tells on you. Yeah. You went to sleep, and the storm came. Reality set in. He says to me, going to have to cast me over. And we know the whale swallowed him. You imagine what was going through his mind in the belly of that whale. Place yourself there if you can. Literally, all that stuff and seaweed wrapping all around your neck and everything that that whale has ate, 
you're down there with it? What's the moral of the story? I would like to finish up this thing not smelling like whale puke. I know y'all probably didn't want to hear that. I could have said regurgitate, but I've never heard a redneck say that. <laughs> but he got right, which is a good part of the story. But three days, three days he was wrong. Now he ran and he obeyed God. But in a town of 100,000 people, something happens every day. Death happens every day. It would have made a big difference to I don't know how many people if Jonah would have went when God told him and not procrastinated. Now I'm not shooting at anybody under the sound of my voice because I'm preaching to myself at the same time. I know that's hard to comprehend, but I'm very convicted myself because every time I want to do more for the glory of God. Things that are we procrastinate, procrastinate on, we need to change that. And just step up to the plate and do what's right. Because all of us Christians have, I'll take care of that next week. Yeah, that is good. That is good. We're going to put that into practice next month. The first of the year, New Year's resolution. We're gonna, I got it wrote down right here. I wrote down right here. I'm going to do it. Have you been guilty of that, Brother Rob? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. But I won't change a message because of somewhere I failed in life. We all can get a little sharper. I want to be sharper after preaching when I walk out this church door is what I want to be. I want to be closer to God when I walk out of this place. I want you closer to God. Would it benefit me? Absolutely not. Does it benefit me all? It all benefits God. And it all benefits God's people. Please don't procrastinate. What happens when Satan comes out of the shadows? Destruction. Salvation, proclamation, transportation, hesitation. Let's not be guilty. Please don't sacrifice what you want most for what you want at the moment. God truly wants us to be blessed far beyond measure. Of all my faults and mistakes, and they've all been not premeditated made. They have been mistakes. God always just scoops his hand around me and says, boy, let me show you how to not do that anymore. Don't do that anymore. It's the sincerity of your heart to what God will bless you even in your mistakes. It's when you plan and premeditate and go on and do that wicked, vile sin, that's enough to disgust God and make him sick. It's abomination to God. But when we make mistakes... I'm trying to do good. And the honesty and sincerity of our heart, there he is. He just scoops us up. He scoops us up, loves us and teaches us and helps us. Boy, we serve a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful God. Amen. I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't. 28 years of living for God. <laughs> Being able to be the daddy that he's allowed me to be and the husband that he's allowed me to be. Had the family. I'm going to end with this. He's no respecter person. Yeah. He won't do one thing for Rob Hicks or Manly Perry or anybody else that he won't do for you. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed.